It's now my pleasure to introduce Chris Perone to you, who's the Director of Improving Access at the California Healthcare Foundation, which works to expand access to coverage and care for low-income Californians. He's been there for a long time and had a huge impact, a really huge impact, on helping to advance their cause. Prior to uh, coming and applying his deep expertise to Medi-Cal, he was in the state of Massachusetts, where he ran the Division of Medical Assistance, or the Medicaid program. He knows quite a few things, and he's going to tell us what he's learned, what's going on in California that's exciting, and anything else he thinks we need to know about. Chris? Uh, it's great to be back here. I've, uh, it's my third time speaking at this conference, and it's uh, always a tremendous job. And uh, I'll add to the, uh, to the kudos for uh, Margaret and Paul. Uh, uh, Margaret certainly is, a, is, in the words of Trump, since we're quoting Trump a lot, she's a winner. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, start uh, with actually a bit of a, I'm going to try to hold it together through this. Um, <clears throat> try to, uh, a little bit of a personal story, because we've had a lot of, particularly Norm Ornstein's uh, talk at lunch, had my stomach uh, churning. Um, and I had a recent experience, um, actually the last four days I've <clears throat> spent um, in the hospital uh, with my, um, when I thought about introducing this, because uh, this is a last minute thing, I did, was this was not part of it, but um, I spent the last four days in the hospital with my mom, who's um, uh, <clears throat> dying. And uh, one of the things that um, I've noticed, because my dad passed away seven years, is um, how much and how early the entire team at the hospital uh, talks about end-of-life care and palliative care and what they call, uh, in, our, in this hospital, comfort care. And that is a tremendous change over the past few years. And we talked about how healthcare costs and what's shaping them and you know, whether or not end-of-life care is the driver or not, it probably isn't the driver, but. Um, clearly, it's a factor, and clearly we know there's a lot of waste at the end of life. And it's just really been a, you know, among all the things that we've seen over the past few years, this transformation in the conversations we have at the end of life are really tremendous. So I just wanted to interject a little bit of um, a good news and all the sort of somber news about all the politics and such. Um, so now I'm going to turn a bit to um, Medi-Cal. And do these, are these supposed to change with? No, they're not. So I will uh, unfortunately have to turn away a little bit. So um, what I wanted to talk about was sort of present a, a future on Medi-Cal's outlook. And this is uh, Howard and I uh, inadvertently are tag teaming a little bit today. I may have some of the slides for uh, bits and pieces of his talk. And I want to present a little bit of the outlook in terms of the vision for Medi-Cal going uh, forward and how we might uh, get there. Um, and just to summarize, uh, we've accomplished a lot in Medi-Cal. Howard touched upon a number of those things. There's essential work that remains to be done. Surprisingly, perhaps, stakeholders support a common vision for what the future of Medi-Cal should look like, and I'll talk more about that. And then uh, there are some clear next steps that we can take, and then some really big challenges remain. So I'll talk about uh, each of these points. Um, just to start with uh, some of the data, again, Howard alluded to much of this. Uh, this is the growth in Medicaid over uh, nearly the last uh, 20 years. And you can see that most of the growth in the program has been in the managed care uh, program. About 80%, 70-80% of Medi-Cal enrollees are now in managed care. Um, most of those that are in fee-for-service, the green slice of these bars, um, are people who don't have full scope Medi-Cal, meaning they're either dual eligibles for whom Medicare is a primary payer, um, they're undocumented Californians for whom Medi-Cal provides only a restricted scope, or they're people who have just got onto Medi-Cal and they're on their way into a managed care plan, but they haven't selected a plan and enrolled in a plan. So 90% of those who have what's called full scope Medi-Cal um, are in managed care plans. Perhaps why we have two health plan uh, CEOs on our panel. It really um, now, the managed care is now the, the foundation and the bedrock of the program. In terms of the Medi-Cal budget, uh, we've also seen a big increase in the size of spending for the Medi-Cal program, but most of that growth has been federal payments to the state. You can see the general fund, which is the green slice of these bars, um, has grown almost uh, nil uh, in the last uh, 10 years. 
Um, the other piece that's grown is what are called other state funds. So these are, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the managed care tax, some of the supplemental payments, the transfers uh, from local government, IGTs and others to the state to help fund the, fund the program. Those have grown as well, but the general fund's grown very little, and that shapes a number of other policies in terms of how we pay for and purchase care in the Medicaid program that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, actually, just coming back to this slide quickly, um, clearly, Howard mentioned one in three Californians, but I wanna take my own little poll and hopefully I'll get a response rate that's better than 9%. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is clearly a 10 percenter crowd, but I'm gonna take my chances anyways and ask, how many of you uh, have a family member or a friend who is covered by Medi-Cal? Yeah, so even in this group, it's you know more or less one in three. And I think it really speaks to the fact that Medi-Cal is not just about that one in three, those one in three. It really is about all of us and the people that we know and live with and, and uh, who, um, uh, whether it's uh, mow our lawns or uh, work at Starbucks for us or uh, they might be uh, students, um, people in their first job out of college. Um, so it really is uh, um, all around us. So just a couple of uh, measures in terms of the performance of Medi-Cal. Just kind of set the stage for um, our outlook in terms of the program's future. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the, the performance of Medi-Cal in terms of its cost, in terms of the enrollee experience, in terms of access to care. So in terms of spending, uh, California is one of the lowest uh, spending states on, Medica on Medicaid. So this is uh, Medi-Cal, or excuse me, Medicaid spending per enrollee in the 10 largest states. Um, and you can see that California is well, and the blue bar is well below the national average. Um, it is uh, the seventh of the 10 largest states in terms of per enrollee spending. Um, so when comparisons are done between California and other states, it's really hard to compare um, and talk about the future of Medi-Cal as it relates to things that are happening in New York or Massachusetts. They are starting from very different places. But by this measure, we're relatively, you could call this, we're relatively efficient is one way to, one way to put it. Now let's look at enrollee satisfaction in two different uh, charts here. Um, one looks at um, a question that we asked Medi-Cal enrollees. We conducted a survey uh, in collaboration with uh, the state uh, of Medi-Cal enrollees, and we asked them in a whole series of questions, and one of them was uh, whether, in their opinion, Medi-Cal was a very good program, a pretty good program, a pretty bad program, or a very bad program. And you can see that 90% um, of Medi-Cal enrollees think it's a very good program or a pretty good program. They're very uh, pleased to have this coverage, to have this source of coverage. So um, by that measure, um, Medi-Cal is certainly valued. Um, then we're looking at this uh, on the right-hand side is some information from the Consumer Assessment of Health Plans, the CAP survey. And this asks members to rate their personal doctor. And this groups health plans into the, whether they, the uh, health plan uh, or the personal doctor got five stars, four stars, three stars, two stars, or one star. And you can see the majority of members rated their doctors two, two stars or less, two or one or two stars. So clearly a long way to go. They're satisfied, they're pleased that they have the coverage, they're really not happy with their doctor. In terms of access, the picture is also a bit troubling. Um, so these are two different measures of access, a um, number of different ways to measure, but these are two that I th we, we think are, are pretty good measures um, from, a, from the California Health Interview Survey. And the first asks whether or not uh, people have trouble finding a doctor who will see them. And this is a comparison of the Medi-Cal enrollees to those with employer-sponsored insurance. And you can see the rate at which Medi-Cal enrollees say they have trouble finding a doctor will see them is three times that of those with employer-sponsored insurance. And on the right-hand side, perhaps even more troubling is, did they visit an ER for a chronic condition because they couldn't see their own personal doctor? And there again, twice as likely to say they visit an ER uh, for this reason among Medi-Cal enrollees than among those with employer-sponsored insurance. And this despite the fact that there is actually federal law that is supposed to guarantee equal access to Medi-Cal enrollees. So we've got a long way to go. So what's that direction we should be taking? Well, we looked at the, um, the state's uh, latest waiver to the federal government, uh, which presents a picture of where the state thinks uh, it wants to take the Medicaid program, um, at least in terms of asking for some more federal money. Uh, and it paints a picture that looks very much like this, which is also uh, when we interviewed about 50 healthcare leaders throughout the state about what they think the direction Medi-Cal should take is, 
many of these same themes. So a coordinated system of care, particularly with people with both physical health conditions and behavioral health conditions, um, to emphasize value and accountability that we measure quality, but we don't do much about it, um, that we measure lots of things, but we don't really hold health plans, which is the primary way in which Medi-Cal operates now, really accountable for that performance. We measure lots of things. That was one thing that came up was, boy, the state is really good at measuring things. Um, it's not so good at deciding which of those measures really matter and then holding its partners accountable for that performance. Um, that we need stable and adequate financing. I'll touch upon this a little bit later. This is probably one of the more difficult challenges in Medi-Cal. And that we need strong leadership from, from the top to the bottom. So I'm going to talk about the path forward, and um, I'm inspired by a, an election that's coming up that is also uh, hotly debated, very controversial, um, very quite polarized, um, but it's happening in just a week and a half. Uh, so I'm going to try to tell the story of the path forward to Medi-Cal through the, through the lens of the Oscars, if you will, um, and starting with the uh, movie Steve Jobs. So when we think about Steve Jobs and Apple Computer, uh, we think about innovation, uh, we think about uh, somebody who's very hard driven, a perfectionist, someone that holds, their, uh, holds his employees accountable. Um, and that's what we should think about in terms of Medi-Cal as well. Uh, that's the future. So this um, is a slide from the Medi-Cal performance, Medi-Cal managed care performance dashboard, something that they created a couple of years ago uh, with our help. Um, and this arrays all the health plan partners in Medi-Cal um, in terms of their aggregate quality scores on HEDIS measures. So it's a composite measure of HEDIS. Um, and uh, each health plan county is a data point here. So on the far left, you have Kaiser Permanente in San Diego and then Kaiser Permanente in Sacramento. And on the far end, you have Anthem Blue Cross in Kings County. Doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum, your rate is going to be the same. I mean, there's, there's demographic differences, but in terms of quality and outcomes, it doesn't matter how well you participate. Now, you may have a quality improvement project that you have to undertake because of low payment, but your payment doesn't matter. So in just the way that we've seen uh, Medicare move to value-based payment, we've seen some of the commercial health plans trying to move to value-based payment, it's time that we see the Department of Healthcare Services, the state of California, moved to value-based payment with its managed care plans. So that's one action that we could take down this path of uh, accountability and innovation. A second is to share savings with health plans. So these are um, these visuals are three uh, three technology startups, um, some further along than others. Uh, two of them we invest in through our innovation fund. Uh, and when I say we invest in them, what we, tr we primarily try to do is take interesting companies that are doing uh, good things and are proven to be effective and bring them into the safety net. Um, and so we have a company here, Health Crowd, that's working around member engagement and navigation, direct dermatology that's uh, improving access to specialist care, uh, Landmark uh, that's partnering with a couple of health plans, uh, Medi-Cal plans here in California to improve care management for those with uh, complex care needs. There could be 30 different images, 40, 50, there could be lots of different images here. The point here is that when a health plan invests in one of these companies and, or technologies, and that saves the health plan money, uh, the health plan sees those savings dry up within two years because of the way that Medi-Cal sets its capitation rates. The health plans don't get to save in those, uh, share in those savings long term. So that's a second step that the state of California could take in terms of really driving value and innovation. Health plans are doing some of this work anyways because it's the right thing to do and many of them have surpluses right now, but we can't hold out hope that they will always have surpluses and always do the right thing and we'd like to see more of them do the right thing. And in order for that to happen, we really need to create a system in which they get to share some savings. So that's a second stone along this path towards uh, accountability and innovation. So the next inspiration is from a really terrific movie. I imagine many of you saw it, and a, a great movie, obviously, for both children and, uh, and adults, um, and really groundbreaking in many ways, and uh, you know, around the emotions that we all have, uh, and the struggle in uh, uh, appreciating the different emotions that we have, recognizing that they're all part of the human condition, uh, managing those emotions. Um, and it really speaks to this notion of the need to better integrate physical and behavioral health care. And so along this path toward the, uh, path toward the vision of Medi-Cal's future, 
uh, the need to advance whole person care is something that can't be a like to have, but has to be a something we must have. So what does this show? This is kind of a busy slide, I apologize. It's from the Department of Healthcare Services and it was produced for a symposium that we held. And it looks at Medi-Cal's highest cost 5%, those are the blue bars, and then the other 95% of the Medi-Cal population. And it arrays them in terms of the prevalence of a whole host of conditions. And you can see the most prevalent condition among uh, the top 5%, the most costly 5%, is having any mental health condition. Serious mental illness is second, just below that, mood disorders. So among the most costly 5%, more than half have a serious uh, a, a mental health condition of some sort. Um, so this notion of, well, we'd like to see the health plans collaborate with the counties and be nice if they had an MOU, memorandum of understanding about that relationship, because the counties still in California are responsible for the care of uh, those with serious mental illness, even if they're a Medi-Cal uh, enrollee. Um, that's not good enough. Um, this, is, this is the core of the Medi-Cal program, not just in terms of driving the cost, but these, frankly, these are the people, this is why we established a Medi-Cal program, is to take care of the most costly, most vulnerable population. So we really need to be driving much harder in terms of advancing whole person care. There is an element in California's waiver that gives counties the option to do that, but um, it has no teeth and has no financing. So it's up to counties, if they have some money to pursue this, they can. But again, this is a place where we need to see um, a much uh, greater leadership, frankly. Probably less of you saw this movie, but you would be surprised that of all the movies uh, that got nominations, uh, this one had the second most nominations. Mad Max. What could Mad Max have to do with Medi-Cal program? <laughs> well, uh, look at those, look at those. I, can you call them cars, automobiles, whatever they are? Um, I see some, I see some from, from the 50s and 60s and uh, really, uh, uh, sort of to Howard's uh, point is you, you take something and you just cobble together things on top of it. Um, it really speaks to me about the chassis upon which Medi-Cal is built. And it's really time to overhaul Medi-Cal's chassis. We have had a Medi-Cal managed care program that aside from growth really hasn't changed since it was vastly expanded in 1995. Uh, the two plan model, the county organized health systems, the geographic managed care model, uh, I was talking with the person uh, who was in state government at the time that was created, and she said, you know, it wasn't our intention that that would be around forever, that we would have exactly the same models, that we wouldn't learn from what we're doing uh, and adapt, um, and yet they've become so entrenched that we're, uh, far be it from actually uh, changing and evolving uh, due to negotiations, we're actually sort of concretizing some of those relationships. Um, so it's really time to revisit that infrastructure. And I'm not actually calling for a particular outcome there, uh, that it should be the county organized health systems, as Howard, as Howard was um, not suggesting, but uh, you know, um, raised the possibility of, because uh, that is not, as he said, that's not gonna work everywhere. But the, the notion that we should have the same model in every county as we had 20 years ago, despite the rapid growth that we've seen in the managed, managed care program, I think is a suspect um, argument. Um, also, in terms of the chassis, we're building this chassis upon lots of very small providers. Uh, managed care, I think, is helping bring some scale to that, but we've got a long way to go, particularly in terms of federally qualified health centers, where there are lots of small ones. Um, if we're really going to uh, manage population health, you need infrastructure, you need scale, you need capital, and that's not going to happen in terms of onesies and twosie docs. It's not going to happen in terms of the FQHCs. Um, uh, that exists now. So the notion of scale, the notion of mergers, the notion of partnerships is something that we really need to promote um, and catalyze. And then finally, um, governance and the infrastructure of the Medi-Cal program. Um, if you contrast Medi-Cal and the Department of Healthcare Services to Covered California, I'm not going to suggest that Medi-Cal should look like, DHCS should look like Covered California, or particularly in terms of some of the rules. There are a lot of protections that Medi-Cal enrollees have that Covered California enrollees don't. Um, but the nimbleness with which Peter Lee can act in terms of purchasing care for his enrollees versus what Jennifer Kent can do in terms of the Medicaid program is night and day. And it's really time to rethink about how we govern and manage this behemoth of a program. Getting close to the, uh, the last, I'm, and I'm getting close to time. Okay, so um, ex machina, many of you have seen this. Um, robots, artificial intelligence, 
workforce. So until we have all those robots doing all our work for us, we're going to need to address something in the workforce just quickly. In Medi-Cal in particular, we know workforce is an issue for everybody in Medi-Cal in particular. These are two slides from a report that we did showing the big gap in primary care between what's needed in, in for the Medi-Cal enrollees and what exists. Um, there's a gap statewide. It's worse in some uh, counties than others. Uh, it exists on the specialty side too. Um, and then uh, finally, the big short, uh, and these are probably the changes that are hardest to come by uh, in terms of our financial system and how we finance the Medi-Cal program. Uh, we mentioned the fact that the program has grown tremendously, but not because of general fund support. Um, you can see in terms of the whole state share, the general fund counts for about half of the Medi-Cal budget. But these other things that we have to fight over and over again every few years um, bring some uncertainty. It makes it very hard for partners, whether they be plans or providers, to make the investments about what, the, what their future is going to look like in terms of the Medi-Cal program. It's something we really need to address. I don't have the solutions there like I did with some of the value-based payment ideas, but um, clearly it's going to be a bugaboo until we address that. Uh, this last slide just shows um, you know, another sort of element of that uncertainty in terms of the state budget deficits, uh, you know, surpluses, deficits, uh, back and forth. Number of other issues to talk about, I just lay those out here, and then uh, just quickly to summarize what I told you I was going to tell you and what I hopefully I've told you, uh, we've accomplished a lot in terms of the Medi-Cal program, in terms of growth, in terms of enrolling folks into managed care, in terms of giving them primary care physicians that essential work remains to be done in, in terms of achieving that vision. Uh, there's a lot of consensus around that vision. There are some clear next steps we can take um, and then some other work that's gonna be much more difficult, but it's time for us all to roll up our sleeves and get started. So thank you.